So this was my life. Really good student, top of my class. Had a great career as a software programmer. Found my other, got married. Built my house, my solitude in the city. Adopted kids, all of another species, <laughs> but very much part of my family. So all looks good on paper, but I had started to feel empty, lost, unfulfilled, and I didn't know why. This eventually led me to an existential crisis where I quit my job and went into self-imposed exile. And there, slowly but surely, I lost myself until I didn't know who I was anymore which led to even more existential crises. As painful as it was, losing myself was a great thing. It made me shed all my adopted identities that I'd unconsciously picked up along the way from parents, from family, from peers, from institutions, from society, and also those that I'd consciously selected off the shelf because it was easier. So for a while, I identified as an atheist vegan feminist, <laughs> also known as a very angry person. <laughs> <laughs> the many days I spent alone helped clear my thoughts. The lack of distractions kept me focused on figuring myself out. What did I want to do with the time I had? To answer that question, I had to connect with what matters most to me, what is meaningful to me. And eventually, I started listening to my deeper truths that were always there, that popped up now and then, but I'd never stopped to give them much attention until then. And I can't say it was a rational process. It was tumultuous, messy, nonlinear. But this inner voice felt real, felt right. So I listened more. And out of that introspection, I began to build up a more real me. You see, I now had a story about myself that felt right. And with that story came a mission with my struggle. Three things had resonated strongly with me during this soul searching. One was this precious gift from my dad the gift of certainty that I could do anything, be anything. He made me feel like that from a very young age as I was growing up in Fiji, and my young self just took it for granted until it became a part of me. And it was only later in life that I fully understood this gift and appreciated his efforts. You see, I come from a culture that is guilty of double standards for girls. And my dad made the decision that he would shield me from this and raise me like a boy. His decision to go against social norms and expectations ensured I never felt less than my brothers. I was encouraged to be defiant, a rebel, a contrarian. Too often, girls are taught to sacrifice. My dad taught me to put myself first. He isn't a perfect man, but he strived to instill in his kids a strong will and the drive to be more. When I was born, the name he gave me, Shama in Sanskrit, identifies with light, flame, the sun, an illuminating agent, a light bearer. He empowered me with everything I needed, an unwavering belief in myself. The second thing that resonated strongly with me was the grace and strength of the women in my family. Being raised like a boy also has its downsides, and it was much later in life that I came to value and appreciate my femininity. My mom balanced family and career. She'd wake up every day at 5 a.m., cook breakfast for everyone, make lunch parcels for everyone, and then get ready and go to work as a school teacher. And at night, she'd make dinner, set us up for the next day, and then great papers. We hardly ever ate leftovers, 
my mom always cooked fresh for us. And she never complained, never asked for thanks, always quietly in the background, making sure the foundations were in place and we all just took it for granted. Her mom, my grandma, was forced to give up her education at a very young age due to certain things demanded of her. When she married, she ran her household as was expected of her, and also her sugarcane farm, her wheat farm, and her jewelry cart. I remember clearly that she would take her two bulls down to the well in the hot Fiji sun, fill up the water drum by herself, and bring it back to be used by the family. She was always so active and full of purpose. She didn't have the luxury to indulge herself in an existential crisis. Or she didn't need to. She already had a struggle. My grandma and my mom sacrificed so I could be selfish. I was the lucky benefactor, the privileged one. It's certainly not lost on me that my beloved adopted country is the first nation to give women the right to vote. The weight of another gift. What was I going to do with it? I felt a deep obligation to do more, be more, be worthy. The third thing that resonated strongly with me was my love for animals. I've always had a deep kinship with my feathery and furry brethren for as far back as I can remember. My parents will be the first to tell you about all the stray animals I'd bring back home and how traumatized I was after watching Bambi. I cried for days. So, in my 20s, I slowly began to realize what the meat on my plate was, which is an odd thing to say, but for some reason, I hadn't yet made the connection between the meat on my plate and the animal it came from. And so began my grand affair with meat, spending many years, a love-hate relationship that eventually resulted in a very bad breakup, followed by a few one-night stands. <laughs> <laughs> and as with any affair, there was always shame after the pleasure, self-torture and introspection, and the romance started to fade as time wore on and meat looked less and less desirable. As meat's bad boy charm lost its power, other vices came to light. Meat was a feed in water hog, a rainforest killer, a water polluter, a carcinogen dealer, and was pals with antibiotic-resistant gangster bugs. Meat also didn't have very good personal hygiene. And meat's bottom burps are so lethal, it's burning up the planet. So I began to see meat for what it was, a deadbeat. I didn't find meat's chubby love handles cute anymore. The one-night stands dwindled to few and far between, and then none. The breakup was for real. What this breakup process taught me firsthand was how difficult it can be to give up the habit of meat, how much work it takes to move to a plant-based diet if you don't know what you're doing. I had my fair share of health issues as I made the transition because I started filling the gap with a lot of highly processed carbs. Why? Because I was lazy and meat was easy. In my desperation, I pretty much tried every product marketed as a meat substitute. Let's just say I think they were having an existential crisis. I'd make a tofu joke here, but you know, that would be tasteless. <laughs> so I had lived the reality that meat tastes delicious, is easy, and has some nutritional appeal. What this somewhat dysfunctional relationship taught me was that now I knew what I wanted from my high-protein relationship. At the very least, I wanted meat that was clean. But I didn't want a boring meat. I wanted meat that could still meet my primal needs. Meat that was fun and scrumptious. Meat that could satiate my hunger. I also wanted meat that was good for my body 
and good for my soul. Meat that I could introduce to my parents. <laughs> and because of my high standards, I knew that the only way to get this new meat was to make it myself. So the obvious question became, could I still make meat just without the animal? If we go back to the drawing board and deconstruct lean meat, we see that it's mostly a combination of water and proteins with some fats and carbohydrates. If we deconstruct the high protein food chain, we see that we get energy from the sun, which is captured by plants through photosynthesis. Animals then eat those plants to make meat, and we eat the animals. So what if we could skip the animal and make the same meat? And not just the same meat, but a better meat, without the carcinogens, without the cholesterol, without the E. coli, and without the bottom burps. I now had my challenge. I immersed myself in literature and technologies, understood the limitations and unknowns, and armed only with possibilities and instinct, I decided to jump in. I launched my startup, Sunfed Meats. Given this was uncharted territory, the first step was to see if we can actually make plant meat. Now by meat, I mean a hunky, toothy chunk of meaty protein that would cook, feel, and taste like animal meat and have a similar nutritional composition of high moisture, high protein, and very low carb. So the bar was high. I got the R&D underway, and long, stressful story short, after a shaky start, we eventually had some breakthroughs. One of the challenges we had set for ourselves was to explore new and different plants. I particularly focused on pulses, which are amazingly sustainable crops. And so it happens. One of our significant breakthroughs came from a type of pea protein from this pulse family. From that humble pea, we made this chicken. It cooks and feels like chicken, and naturally, has more protein, iron, and zinc than chicken, with no cholesterol, antibiotics, hormones, or salmonella. And it's even more cost-effective than chicken, which is the cheapest meat. Importantly, there's zero risk here of inflicting the world with another avian flu outbreak, another Spanish flu. The worst Sunfed can do is inflict the world with peas. And we use a clean and wholesome technique to turn a protein-rich legume into something that is bioavailable to the human body. This technique bypasses the animal and brings us one step closer to the sun. And the closer we get to sunlight, the better things get, be it with energy or food. When we turn to the light, we get cleaner and more efficient, which reduces the stress on the planet. This, dare I say, enlightenment, I think also makes us kinder to each other, to nature, and to our fellow animal kin. One day, way into the future, maybe we'll have humans who can photosynthesize and are liberated from this constant need for food. But for now, we can get one step closer, one step lighter. So after the successful results of our R&D, I realized I finally found meat I could introduce to my parents. So I now wanted to take the product to market, but to do that, I needed a lot more capital than I had. To date, I had self-funded. Our technology requires capital-intensive, high-tech machinery, and setting up a food production plant is no small feat, let alone one with unknowns and no precedent. So I launched our first capital raising round. Raising investor funds is always a pretty big challenge for any startup, let alone a young pre-revenue startup like us. But I knew we had something special, and I just needed to get in front of the right people, which I did. We're now backed by global investors. The seed funding is helping us set up the first plant-based meat facility in the Southern Hemisphere. 
which will kickstart a brand new high-skilled industry and strengthen and diversify our exports with sustainable products that are truly clean, green New Zealand. So now we're working very hard to go to market. Being the first, we're figuring a lot of things out, so it's not smooth sailing. But that's part and parcel of innovation. No easy road exists. You just have to forge your own path. So, is my startup the hardest thing I've ever done? Yes, and it just gets harder. Do I have bad days? Oh, yes. Is my life comfortable? Hell no. Is it fun every day? Am I full of passion all the time? No and no. <laughs> Entrepreneurship is a daily grind. You're creating and building something out of nothing. And that takes perseverance and resilience, especially when you're disrupting the status quo. So would I change it? No. I feel enormously grateful and privileged to have this struggle. Because the struggle is for something now, something meaningful to me, something bigger than me. And that keeps me at it. Maybe I'm just wired for struggle. And without struggling for something, I felt aimless, empty, unworthy of my gifts. Maybe the emptiness was nudging me to get out of autopilot, to take control and create my purposeful life on my own terms. And entrepreneurship is my way of engineering that struggle in my pursuit for meaning. And in this pursuit, I humbly stand tall, knowing I'm a small, lifted part of a mighty tree with strong roots and steady branches, and I'm greener and brighter and see further, thanks to ones that came before me. So in summary, how to engineer your struggle the first world way? Have a breakdown. <laughs> Let go of who you think you are. Listen to your inner voice. Find your mission that is bigger than yourself. Take concrete actions to launch that mission. Embrace the struggle and persevere. Thank you. <laughs>